All right, I want to do a quick video here answering more of the house church frequently asked questions. Uh, this will be the third video. Might need to make a fourth if some people have more questions, but I just, I waited a little while here and, and I thought, well, you know, there are some good questions here and I want to answer this and this might answer people's other questions and things. So I thought I'd just get this thing done quickly here. Um, I'm not going to have my wife read the questions this time simply because I have some of them actually, some of you out there that have really posted some good questions. I'm actually going to show your comment there because I want people to see that. Um, are online forums considered fellowship? Okay, that's one of the questions I had. Online forums, online blogs, any kind of thing where you have people writing back and forth with one another. Okay, now a lot of the brethren would say no. They say, you know, it has to be face to face. You have to, you know, fellowship face to face. If you're not fellowshipping face to face, then uh, then it's not real, true Christian fellowship. Uh, well, there's a couple of issues with that. Uh, let me see here. Um, the second epistle of John, verse twelve, chapter one, you know, verse twelve. It says here, having many things to write unto you, I would not write with paper and ink, but I trust to come unto you and speak face to face, that our joy may be full. All right. Now, what was going on in the first century? They were communicating mostly through letters. That's what most of your New Testament is. The Pauline epistles are letters written to different churches. And I say churches, meaning groups of people. I don't mean buildings. Okay. As you know. So you have people writing forth, writing back and forth with each other. Now, can you do that online? Yes. Yeah, you can. But to teach that you cannot fellowship that way and it has to be face to face. Eh, I don't know about that. And, you know, you got to remember what's going on here in the Bible times. Now, I am, you know, you know me. I am a purist when it comes to the Bible. I believe the Bible is to be our standard for all matters of faith and practice. And I'm not just saying that like a lot of the brethren do. They say it's our, our standard in all matters of faith and practice, and then they go to Bible buildings and they do a lot of things that aren't in the Bible. I try to stick to the Bible as closely as possible. But I also have to look at reality, and I have to say, we have a tool, a, a thing here that we can talk worldwide through the Internet. You're watching me right now, in whatever state or whatever other country even, and you can see me, you can hear me, you can look up the verses that I'm telling you to look up, you can contact me back, you can write in the comments, and I can see the comments within 10 minutes of putting the video up. So we have a different situation right now. Does that mean we should abandon the Bible? No, we shouldn't abandon the Bible. But what I'm saying is there are some things that have changed, okay, and they're not a bad change. Now, is it eventually going to go back to that time like it was here in the Bible where people, believers, can't fellowship online anymore and they can't even talk to each other over the phone? Yeah, I do believe it will go back to that in the time of Jacob's trouble. In that time, Christians are going to, well, not Christians, but saints in that time, I say not Christians because the body of Christ is removed before the time of Jacob's trouble, but saints in that time are not going to be able to communicate online. Okay, that's, they're going to be hunted down. So, Things are going to change at some point in time. But right now, as I'm making this video, there's still freedom enough. We can fellowship online. And you say, but uh, Brian, it's just not the same as face-to-face as -face contact. Well, I agree with that. Many times written contact is better. Why? Because you can get out what you want to say. I'm going to ask for a show of hands here. How many of you have ever been in a fellowship of Christians, congregation, or even a Babel building, and you wanted to say something, never got a chance to because there were a bunch of big mouths running the conversation. See, look at all those people raising hands out there. Look at that. You know? <laughs> no, but seriously, you know, I've been in that type of a situation many times. You know, I've been around brethren. There'll be five or six of us, and we'll be talking about the Bible, some subject, and it's like, uh, yeah, but, 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 and by the time the big mouths shut their mouth, it's on to, another subject and you can't go back to that subject so this thing of you have to have face-to-face -face contact to really truly be in real fellowship I don't agree with that okay and what is the what is the purpose of the brethren assembling together 
Well, let's go to the old standby here, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but look at this, exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now, that's the one that's always thrown at you if you don't go to a Babel building someplace. But can you exhort somebody online through Scripture and through things like this? I'm going to tell you right now, some of my best encouragement that I've ever had comes from what people write to me through email, through comments, down in the comment section. I've, I've learned things. I've been challenged. I've been rebuked by some of the brethren. I've had some of the most amazing, life-changing comments, letters in the mail and things like that. I mean, it's amazing. Through written correspondence, the written word. Okay? And remember, what medium did God choose to use to communicate to man? I believe that would be a written scriptures. So, is writing really a bad thing? No, that's how the Lord chose or what the Lord chose to, to speak to us. So um, if you can, if you're in an area and you can meet with some brethren locally, you get to witness to people or you get to meet somebody online or something like that. And that can even happen. You know, you meet somebody online and they're like-minded and you're talking to them and stuff through email, through YouTube, whatever. And you know, you get to talking and you decide, hey, let's meet someplace. Meet someplace publicly at some kind of a restaurant or at a, at a, a a shopping mall or someplace like that bring your bible it'll weird out the other people you know <laughs> show up you know and you're you'll come walking in like this you know and stuff and you come walking into a restaurant and you sit down you know and, and here comes somebody else they got a bible and it's like you see all the people going you know <gasps> oh, bibles <gasps> you know it's a lot of fun and then you actually sit there and you, you open up the bibles and you start talking about the things of the lord and you start praying and talking about stuff you know, you'll see people like getting up from the other tables and, you know, <laughs> so it's good to, to meet face to face. But if you can't, if it's just online, if there's nobody in your area, whatever, don't feel like you're second rate. OK, can you fellowship online? Yeah, I would say you can. Question number two, what about First Corinthians 14, 26 and every member participating? This is another big one that uh, Frank Viola tries to get across and a lot of these more modern liberal house churches they try to get across um, that everybody should be doing something first corinthians chapter 14 verse 26 says how is it then brethren when ye come together every one of you hath a psalm hath a doctrine hath a tongue hath a revelation hath an interpretation let all things be done unto edifying okay now people will say see paul is saying that everybody's supposed to do something you know uh you know, every one of you hath a psalm. So you should have a psalm or a doctrine or a tongue or a revelation or an interpretation. That's not what the verse is saying. If you start out there, the verse starts with a question. How is it then, brethren? He's saying, why are you doing this? Why? It's not a, con, you know, commendation. It's a condemnation. It's a rebuke from Paul. Okay. You say, how do you know that? Well, verse 33, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all churches of the saints. All right. So you see that there. Jump down to verse 40. Let all things be done decently and in order. All right. And he talks about the women keeping silent in the churches there in verse 34 and 35. So there is supposed to be order there. So when you come, the meeting of the saints is not supposed to be some kind of a thing where everybody has to function. You might have somebody that's just brand new. They don't even know, you know, you're saying, okay, turn in your Bible to such and such. And they're like going to the front and they're looking at the index and they're, okay, page 798. You know, what are you going to do? Call on them and say, okay, what's your tongue for the week? What's your interpretation for the week? No. Um, that verse does not prove that everybody should be doing something. In, in reality, it proves that you shouldn't all be doing things. So don't fall for the 1 Corinthians 14, 26 thing of every member functioning. All right. There are some of you that are just supposed to be sitting there listening. All right. And if the assembly of the saints gets together and there are women involved there, there are women present. They should be learning silently and asking their husbands at home, which, as I've said in other studies, puts a lot of responsibility on the husband to be a good spiritual head, to know the book. 
very important. All right, what is the next question? Um, okay, uh, what if a group has no elders? And this question here, I'm gonna put up the comment. Hopefully you don't mind, brother. Um, Rick Jacoby here. Forgive me if I'm saying your name wrong, brother. But he says, Brian, I think you should discuss the issue of not having elders in your house church. What if you get a bunch of brethren meeting together, but no one is qualified to be an ordained elder? Is it okay to meet without an elder? For how long? Paul commanded Titus to go out and ordain elders in every city. How long is it okay to meet without having an elder? What if you have someone who qualifies, but no other elders who can vouch for him? 1 Timothy 5.22 to ordain him. Okay. Very, very good questions there. Now, let me say this. Um, I am still new to this whole thing myself. So, you know, I don't have all of the answers worked out yet. And again, we've gone so far away from the New Testament practice of this thing where you have elders going out and confirming churches. And that, you know, the apostles were also big time into that where they were actually traveling far away to confirm churches. You see that with Paul. Um, so, you know, how can we do that today? How can we, you know, get back to that? Well, again, again, so you got to, what do you do with the internet? What do you do with uh, other forms of communication that we have that they didn't have in the first century? Um, right now, if I want to talk to somebody living down in the southern part of the state of Maine, I can do it through online. We can call, I can call them on the phone and talk to them on the phone. Uh, in the first century, I'd be walking down there or maybe getting a chariot or something like that, or taking a boat or whatever else. I'd be traveling down there, right? And I would be spending time down there. So that's another thing. Again, our, our busy schedule today. You know, you can't just say, all right, brother so-and-so is going to be the elder here, and we're going to send him two counties over, you know, four-hour drive or something like this, and he's going to stay with that, that young house church over there, that young group that's meeting wherever, you know, uh, he's going to stay there with them and teach them in the things of the Lord and, and ordain an elder in that group. Uh, it doesn't work quite that way. And you say, well, then what are we supposed to do? Quite frankly, you know, I'm open to suggestions. Again, I don't have, I'm not saying I'm the expert on house churches and on house church polity and I know exactly how it's supposed to be done. Um, how do we get back to the practice of ordaining elders, of going and training young men to be able to be elders. Um, you know, that's a kind of a rough thing, to be very honest with you. I don't, I don't really know. Um, I mean, if we would have it that uh, you have teachers of the Word of God and, you know, uh, kind of what we used to do with our house church, you know, we would meet with people that we met online and we would meet with them in a public place and we would talk to them. Now, if there were people that were good and, and everything else, and we did meet some brethren that were, were very good, um, we met some real weirdos, but uh, had a brother, and I won't say his name, but uh, if he's watching, you know who you are. And a uh, very good man. Uh, consider him a friend. He's a, he's a great, really good guy. Uh, family man, has a wife and, and a couple children. And, you know, I would, cons I would feel safe ordaining him as an elder to go to the state where he's going, all right? Um, there are other men I wouldn't. There are other men that I would say, no, sorry, I'm not going to ordain that man. I wouldn't trust him with other believers. So see, again, you have to go and you have to meet with these people. And you can do that online in terms of, okay, I can meet somebody here, but is there someone in the area where we can you know, an elder in the area where we can go and we can say, okay, you ought to go meet with this person or whatever. Again, we're just at the beginning of this thing. You know, we don't really have the organization right now that they would have had back there in the first century. We don't have the same situation. So it's really kind of a difficult question to, to answer. Um, I do believe that there were some groups of Christians in the first century that obviously would not have had an ordained elder at first. But as they learn the scriptures, as they study the word, um, I think one of the apostles would come to them and ordain somebody from that group. You know, and again, these people aren't walking around with finished Bibles either. So 
a lot of this stuff, it's like we, you know, you kind of have to figure this out. I mean, it's, it's, and I don't have it all figured out yet. You know, that's the whole thing. I mean, it's just kind of like we're pioneering this thing and trying to get back to some semblance of the way they did it in the Bible, but yet through the lens of modern technology, through the lens of our modern world. Obviously, if, you know, uh, back in the first century, somebody that lived an hour drive away for us would be a day's journey, you know, a good day's journey. Now we can go an hour and come back. So again, there's so much technology that enters into this thing and some of it's good, some of it's bad. So I, I, I'm not real good at answering that question, to be very honest with you, brother. Um, I do believe that, that there should be, when you have an established group, I think that a man in there should be ordained um, as an elder. And I, again, let me define ordained, all right? Because I think that there, again, we've gotten away from that. So you get men that are coming through the seminaries and they're coming out and they're officially ordained, but they aren't worth shooting spiritually. You know, they're, they're no good. They don't understand the Bible. So they are ordained and officially licensed, but they have no right to preach. Okay, so I think that if we had good ministries out there spread out throughout the country, and as this thing grows and grows and grows, and, and I do believe it is going to grow, by the way, because more and more of the Babel buildings are getting more and more corrupt, and so you're having people saying, I'm not going to compromise, i got to leave this. And many of those people have been in Babel buildings all their lives. Many of them have really been in the Word very, very deeply, and they are more than qualified to lead groups of new believers. So how do you ordain? How do you go and how do you make this official and everything else? That's an interesting question. Um, then I have here another one, uh, Joshua Richards. He says, what are the biblical qualifications to start a KJV house church, assuming there is not one in the local area so that you don't have to physically move? All right. Um, let me just answer that one real quickly here. Uh, the biblical qualifications to start a KJV house church. Well, again, see, we have the wrestling here between first century practice and modern day practice today. There's no way that you could have heard preaching, good preaching, in the first century unless you had a, a minister there, a man that's uh, a pastor, you know, preacher, teacher of the Word of God. You know, if you have a man like that there in the first century, well, okay, then you can study the Word. But you can have somebody gets brand new saved. They find a, a gospel track that was on a park bench. They don't even know who put it there. They take it. They read it. They get saved. It says, buy a King James Bible. They go home. They get on the internet and they type in King James Bible. Boom, it comes up with a bunch of King James Bible believing preachers. They start watching it. They get instructed in all the doctrines. And many times you get somebody that's a brand new convert three months into their salvation. They'll know more than somebody that's been in Bible buildings for 40 years. Now, what do you do? See? You say, well, they've just only been saved for three years, so they're not qualified, you know, to start a house church. How do you, how do you determine that? You know, you might get somebody that's three years saved, or, or excuse me, three months saved, and they spent that three months, you know, struggling with uh, television watching and video games, and they're, and they're having problems with their flesh and stuff. And they wouldn't be qualified to start a house church. You know, I, I guess the question would have to be asked, what's the purpose of you starting a house church? Um, what would be the point of it? Well, to, to teach other people about the Word of God. Okay, are you qualified? Do you have the resources? Do you know where to go to teach somebody? Again, you know, I know of brethren out there that, that will tune in to this channel here every Sunday morning and they'll have a laptop computer and they set it up and they listen to me preach. See, that wasn't available in the first century. You say, well, then it's wrong. Is it really wrong? You have the technology now. You have the ability to hear a man preaching the word. You can look it up. You can discuss it in your group afterwards. See? So, what are the qualifications? Well, you know, how well do you know the Bible? What are you going to do with this group if you start a house church? See? It's kind of a thing there. Next question, he says, To go along with that question, does a KJV house church have to start with either a pastor and or elders? What are their qualifications? Okay, and again, you know, 1 Timothy chapter 3, 
is you know the the big thing there about you know a man that's a bishop and things and it goes through the qualifications and again you know I got to challenge that because there are some that do have those quote unquote qualifications yet they don't know the Bible they don't know the Bible they're not really qualified to lead so the system can be tweaked either way you know so you know does a KJV house church have to be started by a pastor or elder? Um, you know, see again, you know, are we talking locally here? Some guy comes into the local area and, and gets these believers together and, and trains them and teaches them? Well, that's first century, and I'm for that. But today you have the internet. You have a lot of video and audio and things like that. They can be taught just as, as well. Now, at some point in time, you get a guy and he says, well, I understand the Bible and there's really nothing for me to do in any of these local Bible buildings here. I know the Lord wants me to do something with all the information he's given me. I guess I'm just going to try to serve the Lord with my life. And if the Lord's going to ordain somebody, you know, if, if I have to be ordained, then the Lord's going to have to do it. Uh, that's pretty much what I did. Okay. And, you know, I... It wasn't that I tried to you know, run away from Babel buildings and I didn't want anybody over me or anything else. I tried. I tried. I went to these different Babel buildings and I tried to be in ministry there. And it was just like, well, we, you know, you should go to Bible college. You should go to Bible college. And I'd say, oh, well, show me it in Scripture and I will. Well, it's not in the Bible, but, you know, you still should. And you're, you're in sin by not going. And I'm like, well, uh, what are they going to teach me that I don't already know? And I wasn't saying that from a point of arrogance. It's just I have talked to these guys from Bible college and they don't know the Bible. <laughs> and so they don't believe the Bible, half of them. So again, you know, I, I just, I feel that, you know, in our present time here, I think that, that just studying the Word and getting all the resources that you can and then saying, you know, I'm going to try to witness to other people and if I can get other people saved, I get somebody saved down the road or something or some guy I work with or whatever else, just go meet with them. Again, you don't have to have a, a specific group of people that come together on a weekly basis right away. You can work up to that if that's what the Lord's called you to do. You know. So, third question he says here, does a KJV house church have to be started uh, by having someone first sent out by another house church? Uh, no argument intended, honest questions. Well, I understand that. I appreciate that. Um, does a KJV house church have to have somebody else come in and start it? Well, again, we're back to the thing of the purpose of ordaining elders. If you have a man, if you have a group of elders there, um, and they send somebody, you know, over to an area to, to kind of talk to some people, you know, I'm all for that. I think that's a good thing. But if what if there aren't any in the area? You know, and I, and I didn't answer, you know, one of Brother Rick's questions there. The thing about, um, you know, uh, no other elders can vouch for him. If there's only just one, you know, uh, uh, no other elders can vouch for him to, el to ordain him. You know, what do you do? Well, you put that in the Lord's hands. It's just as simple as that. And I would say the same thing there um, for, uh, do you need a, somebody from another house church to start a house church. Well, if there's none in the area, uh, no. You know, and of course, you know, maybe in the future it'll get to a point where the house church movement will get so big among Bible-believing Christians that you will have men uh, that can actually travel around and meet with small groups of Christians. And there will be a network of people and they can kind of communicate somehow, I don't even know how, through phone or whatever. And you can send men around to these different small congregations and teach them the word and ordain them, you know, as elders. Uh, again, you know, it's it's a really kind of a weird situation that we're in right now. Um, but going on to the next question, I'm going to keep things moving here. What about communion? Okay, that's another question I've had. Uh, what, what do you do about communion? Well, um, I know some brethren that, that uh, they have communion once a year. Um, I know others that have it every Sunday. I think that's a little bit extreme. But uh, communion, what is the purpose of it? Well, if you read there in 1 Corinthians, um, it talks about, you know, 
I can turn to it here. Instead of just saying it talks about it, I'll turn to it. Uh, it's a time of, of self-judgment. It's a time to clean up problems that you might have in your life, which I think is a good practice to be into. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses, uh, um, I'd say probably verse 24, um, down to verse 29, probably right in there. You know, and you can do just a little communion service in your in your group, and uh, if even if you don't have that many people, you know, just get some grape juice. I don't believe in wine. Doing it with wine, that's kind of a Catholic thing. Um, I wouldn't mess with wine, but grape juice. You know, the the new wine. It's called in the Bible. New wine is in the cluster. The Bible talks about. So I'd stay with new wine, and because uh, it is New Testament in, in the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, Hebrews chapter nine. And so I'd stick with new wine and get some unleavened bread. I remember growing up, you know, the Babel building I grew up in, they used oyster crackers. So I don't know if that's <laughs> uh, unleavened bread or not, but, you know, it's just a thing of you're doing it to examine yourself and say, okay, are there sins that I've not confessed, confessed up to stay in fellowship with the Lord? And if you're just like, oh, whatever, it doesn't matter. Then it says there in uh, verse 30, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. All right. Verse 31, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. It's a time of self-judgment. So do you need an official ordained priest to stand up there and do the official mass and all this stuff? No. You don't need any of that. Um, you can do communion yourself. You don't need an official ordained preacher, I believe. I don't believe that you need that. Um, to do a little communion service just between you and the Lord or your little group there and stuff, you know. Again, um, it's not really important who is doing it. It's important why you're doing it. Uh, it's in remembrance. And to show the Lord's death till He comes. You know, that's an important thing too. The second coming there. Um, making that tie into the thing. You know, it's uh, there again. The second coming is out ahead of when we're going to be leaving at the time of Jacob's trouble, before the time of Jacob's trouble. But even then, it's just like we're expecting the Lord's return, so you want to purify yourself. You want to make sure that you're getting rid of your sins and, and, and not messing around in sin. And I understand you're never going to be sinless. You're never going to be sinlessly perfect. But you should be self-judging all the time. The Christian life is a life of repentance, of turning from those sins. Okay. And not before you get saved and everything like people try to say, I teach, I don't teach that. So, communion, I think is a good practice. It's something that you can do in your little group there. I think it's something that's good to do once in a while. So, uh, no hard, fast rules about that. Okay. Another question that I've actually been talking about recently, I had a chance to meet with um, meet a Amish man, and he's actually a saved Amish man. And we got to talking about what do you believe, what do you believe, you know. And he asked me, he said, what do you believe about uh, washing feet? Okay. And where they go with this is 1 Timothy chapter 5. Um, I'll show you here quick. 1 Timothy chapter 5. And there's other places too, but this, this is another one that they do. Um, verse 10. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 10. I'm talking about a widow. Well reported of for good works, if she have brought up children, if she have lodged uh, strangers, if she have washed the saints' feet, if she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. Okay, now, what the idea is there, that it's a sign of humili humility to wash the saints' feet. Now, it's not men washing the women's feet or women washing, women washing men's feet. It's men washing the other men's feet and women washing the other women's feet. And it's supposed to be this thing, I know the Amish do it, and some others uh, do it as well. It's a humility, a practice in humility, where you're humbling yourself and showing I'm a servant to other people. And what do I think about that? Well, I think it's a nice thing to do. Is it a requirement? No. No. Uh, why was it done? So you have to look at that. Well, in the first century, they're walking around in desert areas with sand and um, wearing sandals. So, it's pretty much a practice. Wherever you go, you're going to be washing your feet. Because if you don't, you're going to have all kinds of problems. Health issues. So, it was something that was needed. It'd be kind of like saying, you know, if she had watered the horses, 
Well, they had a lot of horses back then that they would use for transportation. We don't have too many horses nowadays. So it's something that changed. You know, I'm not against brethren doing it, but again, you can't force it from the Bible. And a lot of Amish will do it, and they are doing it as house church practitioners. Okay, meeting in homes. You know, I had somebody recently say too, you know, you shouldn't say I'm a house church Christian because then you're classifying yourself that you have to meet in a house and stuff like this. And I understand that, okay. I mean, I understand, you know, you don't really want to classify yourself one way or the other. Um, it doesn't matter where you worship. It doesn't matter, you know, where you're meeting at. The reason I'm so much against Babel buildings is because Babel buildings brings a certain practice along with it. You wear your Sunday best, you come in, you act differently in the Babel building than you do outside the Babel building. You gotta go to weekly attendance, you gotta you got all the baggage that goes along with Babel buildings. Okay. Now if you get a, a bunch of brethren together and they say let's meet together in a barn, and they're just coming together there to study the word and to, to prepare to go out and evangelize the lost, whatever. But you start calling it a church and you start to make it a holy place and everything else, and you act differently there, you're going back to the baggage. And that's why I'm against that. So, I think that answers the questions for now. Um, again, you know, like I said, I'm not the end-all expert on this thing. I mean, it's a lot of this stuff is new to me. You know, I've been uh, kind of just like praying about, you know, Lord, what is my responsibility here? Um, you know, I have the online ministry, but I also have offline ministry. Uh, there are people that I'm meeting with. Um, people out there that are saved that I meet with. Uh, you know, I had an opportunity to, I told a little bit of this story, I think, but I was, you know, talking to an old Vietnam veteran, and I'm sitting in this guy's hut on the floor, and there's bullet holes in the floor from where he gets drunk and shoots his guns off into the floor, and I'm sitting there witnessing to the guy, you know. And a lot of that stuff I don't talk about online, you know, so... Um, now, if that guy gets saved, what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to tell him to go find a good local church. <laughs> no. What I'm going to tell him is I'm going to say, okay, um, hey, let me get you something here. You know, right here, I got a King James Bible for you, okay? Now, I'm going to bring this King James Bible over, and I'm going to bring you some of these little booklets over in here that will teach you about different subjects. And... Uh, when you're done with that, I'm going to bring you back some more materials. And I want to get you a hymn book, and you can start to see the old hymns, and you can, maybe I'll get you a CD that you can hear the old hymns and things, and, and whatever, whatever. I'm going to go there, and I'm going to train him, and train him, and train him. When he's done learning all these things, he's done learning what I can teach him, then I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to teach you how to win a soul to the Lord. You know, and he'll probably be witnessing before then. You know, I can't control people winning souls, you know. That's just going to come naturally after you can say you're going to want to tell people about it. So, um, and then, you know, I talk to him, and now he talks to somebody else, gets them saved, and then I go over there and I start to meet with them. And see, that's how the thing spreads out. All right. And if you're here online and you're studying the Word and studying and studying and studying, be open to what the Lord has for you in the future. I mean, all this information here, and I'm not doing this to brag, please don't think that. But all this information here, I wanted to learn, I wanted to study, I had questions. And I'm just like, Lord, you know, what do you have for me? I want to do something for you with my life. I don't want to just be Mr. Woodturner, artist guy that's selling to rich people. I want to actually do something for you. So the Lord put me in the ministry. It's his fault, blame him, if you don't like me being in ministry. But uh, the Lord put me in this thing. And I'm trying to work through it, you know. I'm trying to figure what the Lord wants for myself and my wife. You know, what does He want for our future? Um, is, it, is it going to get to a point where I get kicked off the Internet? Probably. I can't imagine it going on forever till the rapture. I mean, I hope I can stay on as long as I can, but if it gets to a point where they're saying we need facial recognition technology and we need to, you need to scan your thumb or something to get online and we need to give you an RFID tag and stuff, no, <laughs> bye. And I'm not doing that to quit the ministry. I'm going to still continue ministry, but it's going to be more on a local level. So, and at that point in time, if I'm no longer online and there's still people that know how to get in contact with me and somebody says, hey, I'm 
a county or two over here in Maine, could we, you know, meet with you sometime? We have some brethren that are newly saved. Do you have some resources? Um, a few. <laughs> you know, I have a few resources. <clears throat> I'd be willing to do that. Um, write out some things. Write out articles and whatever else. Go meet with some brethren and start doing that kind of thing. I'm open to what the Lord wants. So, you know, we're all going to have to kind of face these times that are coming up here and ask ourselves these questions. What does the Lord want, you know, us to do? Where He has us planted? You know, um, the things that you've learned, are you ready to commit those to other people? To faithful men who shall be able to teach others also? Are you able to do that? Are you looking forward to doing that? I mean, don't just plop yourself down in front of the, in front of the Bible feeding trough here and just get fat on the Word of God and never give any of it out to other people. Don't do that. Be open to what the Lord has for you. And that we need to grow this thing together. Um, I can't be the answer guy, you know, that answers everything and I'm the head of the, the Denlingerite House Church movement, you know, you know, Menno Simons, the Mennonites, you know, and, and all these other guys name, name their denomination after themselves or the people name it after they die or whatever. I am not the least bit interested in that. What I want people to do is just to get back to reading and believing the King James Bible. This is your final authority. One last time. Not me. And, you know, let's work through this thing. You know, let's, let's share ideas. Let's, let's, let's talk about this while we still have the freedom here online. You know, there again, uh, I said this in another video here or two, but uh, this book, Tortured for Christ by Richard Vernbrand, they had an, a huge network of underground house churches. And the underground church was just people, there were people in the police, the Soviet police, the communists, that were helping to put out tracks, <laughs> printing tracks, you know, people in the military that were secret Christians. Okay, you can have a huge elaborate network of Christians that are spread out all over the place and you're connected through the Holy Spirit and you meet with other people and you start talking to them and you go, oh, I'm getting a weird feeling here. Uh, okay, well, it was a nice talking to you. You know, it's a nice day, isn't it? A real beautiful day. And you walk away, you know. Whereas you get to talking to somebody and you'll have this thing happen. If it hasn't happened to you already, it will happen eventually. Where you start to talk to somebody and you realize they're on the same page. You know, it's such a wonderful thing to have that fellowship. They believe the King James Bible. They think the world's getting worse. And it's just like they love the old hymns. They can't stand the modern Bible building system. And, and they're just like, oh, wow, you know, so many things in common. Network with those people. Get to know those people, you know, and get into ministry. You know, use what you've learned, what the Lord has taught you, to spread the gospel out. And not just spreading the gospel, not just winning souls, winning souls, but also spreading the Bible truths. The things that you're learning, spread those out. So, I hope I've answered the questions that were there. Um, hopefully I've answered those. And uh, if you have any other questions that I haven't covered, put them down in the comments. We'll have a part four. You know, let's keep this conversation going. It's, it's going to be an important thing. Like I said, right now we have the freedom. And uh, I don't know how much longer it's going to continue. I mean, we could have, they could, you know, there could be some kind of a terrorist attack and they could blame Christians and we could be in, you know, detention camps in a month from now. I don't know. You know, it depends on how the Lord protects us, whether or not he protects her, just says, okay, time to go into persecution. Uh, we are, we are well beyond what we deserve as a nation. God's very, very long-suffering, very patient, very gracious. And so he's really keeping the doors open for us. Let's, let's use it for his glory. Um, that's, that's real important. And I, I just want to say that I appreciate all the brethren out there that are, that are taking my videos and mirroring them on their own channel, making other channels, helping to disseminate the information. I really do appreciate that. Again, I will spend the time, I will put in the time to put together a lot of the studies and things. And you say, well, I, Brian, I don't feel like I'm qualified to preach. I don't feel like I'm qualified really to put these messages together. Then use my stuff, okay? Um, 
take all my videos off the internet. You can get downloaders and stuff, some for free, some you pay a little subscription, yearly subscription or whatever. You can get downloaders, download my videos, put them on, onto an external hard drive, burn them on the DVDs, give them to people. Somebody says, well, I wonder what the Bible teaches about uh, tithing. Here's something. I wonder what the Bible says about the rapture. Is it really biblical or whatever? Here's a video. You know, like that. Again, you might run into people that don't have internet connection. You know, it's, it is a challenge, what we're facing here as the body of Christ. As we're moving away from the Babel building system, you know, and moving back towards many of the practices of the first century. So we're going to need to network. We're going to need to share these ideas and say, what do you think about this? And what do you think about that? That's the purpose of these videos. Um, again, I'm not trying to, to control the movement and everybody comes to me for the answers. I'm not trying to do that. I'm trying to start conversations and, and get people to think. You know, think outside the Babel building. So that's going to be it. Like I said, if you have any other questions I haven't covered and I haven't been covered in parts one or two, watch those. Put them down there in the, in the comment section and I'll try to do a video number four answering your questions. Um, and I love to see the comments. I love to see the back and forth between the brethren. So that will be it. Please keep us in your prayers. Thank you for watching.